there are three characteristics of fact that was proclaimed in the early apostles' charisma preaching. Now, we have looked at the content. We have looked at some stages in the way they preach it. Now, we want to look at three characteristics of the fact that they proclaim in their charisma preaching. Now, the fact is that they, they proclaim historic fact. The fact they proclaim were historic fact, and we have mentioned some of this. They are not just talking about, you know, fact of nature or rational deduction or philosophical wisdom or mystical experience. The fact they proclaim rests on historical events. So that's the first thing. They proclaim historical fact. Jesus, God invaded our, our realm as a, at, a, at a certain time. In the incarnation, God became a man. God dwelt among us. The message they preached were based on historical fact. Jesus was born. Fact. Jesus grew up. Fact. Jesus had 12 disciples. He went around Judea, Capernaum, Galilee, Jerusalem. He was preaching a gospel of the kingdom. He was healing. He raised the dead. He did all those things. Fact. He, he preached sermon. There were parables. He was, he was persecuted. He was challenged by the religious leader of the day. Fact. He was arrested. He was, you know, unjustly judged. He was crucified. He was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He, sh he showed himself to his apostles and he ascended into heaven. Fact. Those are facts. Okay. And these facts were preached by the apostles and i want you to know all these different aspects of this message because we are going to go today by the grace of god and maybe next time to look at you know sample of this preaching and see how this fact were brought out these are facts and what the preach is based on this fact and they didn't preach this message in far away country they preached this message where the event actually took place so they proclaim historical fact you know we live in a world now where people want to change the fact okay people want to preach you know an intellectual a philosophical an ideological sermon no we preach jesus him crucified resurrected and ascended that is fact and that is the fact that we preach. And that is the fact that number one will make a difference. That is where the power is. And that reality must be made uh, a reality in our experience by the Holy Spirit. And then we'll be able to proclaim it. So that is the first characteristic of the fact that the apostles preached in their sermon. That they preached historical fact. Number two, this historical fact they proclaim. They proclaim it as being unique, absolute, unrepeatable, and final. Okay. Now, fact preaching a fact by itself is not the end of it because you know historical fact can actually come again and again. But they preach this fact that this fact we are preaching is unique. This is something that has never happened before. And this fact is something that will never happen again. It's unrepeatable. It is final. And the word we read over and over in the gospel is once and for all. Once and for all. Once and for all. This fact. Now, the Old Testament pointed forward to this fact. The, the, the prophets... No, they, they, they spoke about this, but they were looking forward to it. They were trying to, to look into it and say, what does this mean? What is the implication of this? When is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? They were investigating. They were trying to look into it. But this fact, this historical fact of Jesus, they preached it as unique, as absolute, as unrepeatable, and as final. There is not going to be another Savior. There is not going to be another Messiah. There's not going to be another man like Jesus, another son of man. There's not going to be another way, another truth, another life. There's not going to be another name that is given among men whereby we met myself. There's not going to be another way of salvation. This is it. This is all heaven have to offer. This is what heaven has promised. And this is what heaven has fulfilled. And this is all that heaven have to offer 
offer. And what heaven offer is enough for our salvation. It is enough for our regeneration. It is enough for our sanctification. In fact, it is much more than enough for all those things. It is much more than enough for our glorification. And you know, that was the premise of the book of Hebrew, saying that God has given us heaven's best, that heaven has given us his best, that if we will reject it, there is no other salvation, that nothing else, nothing else can stand at the level, nothing else can, can compare what God has given. And that is what the book of Hebrew was doing, was comparing Jesus to, to what the prophet said to Moses, to the Old Testament, you know, um, uh, priesthood, and was saying is is better than Moses as his son is better than the servant is better than the angel because he's the God of glory is the king of righteousness and rule the scepter of his kingdom is the right scepter is better than, than, than the priesthood in the Old Testament they die they have to offer offering every week but here he is eternal and by one suffering once and for all he has saved to the uttermost though that has come to him and that he has brought in a better covenant based upon better promises and that is their message that number one they preach historical fact and that this historical fact this event is a one off event is a unique absolute unrepeatable event is a final event is a once and for all i will read first peter 3 chapter 18 for christ also had once suffered for sin the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit you can see that word has once suffered but christ also has once suffered once it is once and for all let's look at jude jude chapter one there's only one chapter in jude jude chapter one verse three beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the uncommon salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly continue for the faith, wait for it, which was once delivered unto the saint. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27. Who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sin and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Finally, let's read Hebrews chapter 10 and I'm going to read verse 10. By the wish will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. Once and for all. Praise the Lord. So that is what we see here. Number one, they proclaim historical fact. Number one, they proclaim this historical fact as a unique, absolute, unrepeatable and final event. Then number three, the fact they proclaim were eschatological fact. What do we mean by that? What they are saying is that this was event that the prophets have prophesied. What they are saying is that what the prophet prophesied in the past, in prophecy and apocalyptic writing, they spoken of this age that was to come. And they are saying that that age, that age that was prophesied in the Old Testament, that the day of the Lord, that messianic age, the, that that time was fulfilled, that the age that was to come, what the scripture, what the theological people call eschaton, that that age, that time was fulfilled. The age of the Messiah has begun. Obviously, there is still a future consummation of that age. There's still a future final consummation. But what he's saying is that that which the, uh, the prophet, that which the prophet prophesied, that which they were saying something is coming. The Messiah is coming. The, the, the age that they are proclaiming that was to come and they were saying it has happened. That which God promised unto the Father. He has fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus. So that, what, that is what we see in the message, the fact that they proclaim, number one, that it was an historical fact. Number two, that this fact is a once and for all. And number three, that this fact are eschatological fact. That in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see fulfillment upon fulfillment of that which was promised and which was prophesied in the Old Testament. And that is why you will hear the writer says that the time was fulfilled. The time has come, okay? It has been fulfilled according to that which 
was written, that it might be fulfilled that which was written. And that is what we see in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the message. We are looking at this kerygma, this gospel, this evangelistic preaching that we see in the book of Acts, by which power attended. And what we are saying is that the message that was then, this was the message that was then expounded for us in the book of the epistles. It's not a different message. It's not a different gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 3, Paul said, according to the grace of God, which was given unto me as a wise master builder, I believe we read this before, I have laid the foundation and another builder to their own, but let every man take heed how he builded thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ, okay? Paul was an apostle. The Lord Jesus revealed to him the same revelation he gave to the other apostles. That is the foundation. There is no other foundation that can be laid but that which is laid. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So what we are going to do by the grace of God, we are now going to look at this eight evangelistic sermon. I've mentioned this before. Remember, I said that the book of Acts is a book of sermon. Now, there are 19 sermons in, in the book of Acts, but not all of them are evangelistic sermon. There are various sermons. There are evangelistic sermon. There are speeches of defense. There are speeches in the church council. But we are focusing on these eight evangelistic sermons. Three of them preached by Apostle Peter, two of them preached by Philip, and three of them preached by Apostle Paul. So the three evangelistic sermons preached by Peter, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 41, the one that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 26, is the second evangelistic sermon that Peter preached at Solomon's pouch. That was after the healing of the man that was lame from the mother's womb. And the third one is the one Peter preached in Acts chapter 10, from verses 1 to 48, that was at the conversion of of Cornelius. And from Peter's sermon, we saw that the gospel preaching in the first century involved these four things. Number one, the proclamation of the death, burial, resurrection, and lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, extolling the character of Jesus that he will one day return. Number three, he called on people to respond with faith, repentance, and baptism. And number four, he offered remission of sin and refreshing gift of the Holy Ghost. So we are going to come back by the grace of God. I'm going to look into one or two of this sermon of Peter so that we can actually see how these various facts were presented in their preaching. And by the way, I'm using quite a number of um, resources here to go through some of these things. Praise the Lord. Now, that was what Peter preached, the three evangelistic sermon that Peter preached. Like I said, we are going to come back and look at a couple of things. Now, let's look at the two that were preached by Philip. Okay, the first one was the message that Philip preached in the city of Samaria. That is Acts chapter 8, verses 4 to 11. Now, one of the things you will see in the sermon of Philip is that the Bible did not actually give us the complete transcript of the message that Philip preached. But from what we've learned about the message, we can we can understand because chapter 12 says that, and when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So we, we have the summary of the content of the message that, that Philip preached. The Bible says that he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And they were baptized, both men and women. And then the second sermon that Philip preached, we see in again in chapter 8 from verses 26 to 40. That was the one Philip preached to the utopian eunuch in the Gaza desert. Again, we are not given the full detail of what he preached. But when you look at verse 35, it says, beginning with that scripture, Philip preaches Jesus to him. So from Philip preaching, we saw that this kerygma preaching included proclaiming the kingdom of God and the name or the character of Jesus Christ, calling on people to believe on him and preaching the necessity and the immediacy of baptism by sincere believer in his name, in his authority. And that is what we see 
in the preaching of Philip, okay? Philip obeyed the great commandment, the great commission. He went into all the nation. He went into Samaria to preach the gospel. And he made disciples by them receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. But one of the things we see here in the ministry of Philip is that he preached the immediacy of baptism. And we saw it also when, when in, in Samaria. We saw it when he baptized the, the utopian eunuch. He said, this is what, what prevents me from being baptized. So, so we saw that in the three evangel, I mean two, sorry, evangelistic uh, sermon that was preached by Philip. Finally, let's look at that which was preached by Paul. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of this because when we are looking at the epistles, we are going to look at the sermon of Paul in a deeper dimension. So we saw this evangelistic sermon by Paul, one, the one he preached in the synagogue at Antioch, that was Acts chapter 13 from verse 16 onward, the one he preached at the Areopagus in Athens, that from Acts chapter 17 verses 16 to 34, and then when he was under house arrest in Rome from Acts chapter 28 from verse 23 to the end. Now, Again, when you look at all these things, all these messages that Paul preached, you will see that it you will see that it has the same content like those of Peter and those of Philip. In fact, the very last verse, let me read that to you. So, verse 30 and 31. And Paul dwelt two old years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him. What was he preaching? Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. Preaching the kingdom of God. What does it mean to preach the kingdom? And you will see that this was the message. You know, the kingdom, preaching the kingdom is preaching the king. Here, we are preaching the kingdom. Here is the king. He is the king of the, the king of the kingdom of God has invaded our realm. And he has come against the kingdom of darkness. Okay. And in this kingdom, Jesus is king. And we know something about our king and we know of the glory of the power. He was preaching the kingdom of God. Jesus preached the kingdom. John preached the kingdom. The apostle preached the kingdom. So we are going to come back by the grace of God and see what that is all about. But this was their message. This was their message. To preach the kingdom is to preach the gospel, is to preach the Christ, is to preach the reality, the event of what has, got, has happened and what God has accomplished by that event and what that means to us as a people today. So that is what we see in all the eight evangelistic sermon that we see in the book of Acts. So when we look at all these eight together, what was the summary? That the gospel con contained facts to believe. Okay, that's the first thing. When we preach the gospel, we believe that the Holy Spirit will convict men of sin and people will come to believe. They will believe that Jesus died for their sin. He was buried. He rose again according to the scripture. And that this Jesus now reigns as king and that he will one day return to judge the world. So that is the first thing we see in all this gospel, I mean, gospel preaching. They contain facts to believe. Number two, they contain command to obey. So it's not just about believing facts with our head. It's that we are convicted of our situation, of our, our need for a savior, and will begin to respond. Faith. So the preaching of the gospel must generate faith in the heart of the unbeliever and also faith in the heart of the believer. Faith in Jesus as the Son of God who died for our sin and that must bring us to repentance and making the decision to turn for our sin to live for God. It must lead us to confession of our faith in Christ Jesus as the Son of God and also it must lead us to baptism. Okay, immersion in water and for the remission of sin. Now, lastly, Looking at these eight gospel, it also tells us that the gospel taught thing contain promises to receive. Okay, so we receive salvation, remission for our sin through the blood of Jesus, but we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are empowered to live a holy and a victorious lifestyle. And also we have the promises of resurrection and eternal life and hope and comfort to spend eternity with him when he comes again. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying that if you are listening to me today and you are not a believer, that you will run to him, 
Okay, there's a fact to believe Jesus is Lord. He came, he died, he rose again so that you can be saved. Now, will you want to put your faith in him? Will you run to him and repent of your sin and ask him to come into your life and save you? And when you do that, there will be promises for you to receive. The promises of salvation, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the power of God coming into you and God through Christ Jesus, by the Holy Spirit coming to indwell in you, they will make you a son and a daughter, and they will walk this life with you, and finally you will spend eternity with him in the new heaven and the new earth. Do it today. And if you are a Christian, we still have that same message. We still have that same gospel. And that gospel promises us the power to live life to the glory of God, even on this side of heaven. And we can get into the word and take the word of God and live by it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.